Well, I probably first got interested uh, when I was a kid and my dad had my brother and I each buy a stock, which, by the way, the one I bought was a total dud, like the vast majority of individual stocks. Tennis hackers like me, we, we typically don't win a match by ha having dozens of winners. We typically win a match by making fewer mistakes. And, and that's kind of when it comes to investing. You know, the, the second best thing is to do nothing on the investment portfolio. The only thing better is to do that rebalancing occasionally. It's not the home run, it's the inertia of, of the long run returns of the compounded market that tend to work over time. Very, very boring. I tell people if they're having exciting excitement in their investing, they're probably doing it wrong. Have an exciting life, have a boring investment portfolio. Hi, and welcome to Catching Up to Fi, a podcast on mindset, money, life, on the journey to financial independence. I'm Bill, and I'm a late starter. I'm Becky, and I'm also a late starter, and we're your hosts. We're here to help you with your journey to financial independence, no matter where you're starting from. We're going to talk to other late starters, experts, and we'll explore topics related to our mission. Join us as we catch up to Fi together. Hello, and welcome back to Catching Up to Fi. I'm Bill Yount with my co-host, Becky Heptig, and today we have Alan Roth on the show. We're very excited to have him. Alan is the founder of WealthLogic LLC, which is an hourly-based investment advisory and planning firm that uses behavioral finance, logic, and data to develop a financial approach that will produce significantly higher real returns than most investors for their desired level of risk. He has been working in the investment world for 25 years in corporate finance and also has additional decades of experience in portfolio construction and performance benchmarking. Alan takes pride in being mocked on a semi-regular basis by some financial professionals for his hourly fee model and its obvious inability to make him rich. He is also author of How a Second Grader Beats Wall Street and writes for AARP, Barron's, ETF.com, Advisor Perspectives, and others. Alan has taught investments in behavioral finance at the University of Denver, Colorado College, and the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. He currently teaches continuing education classes on the subject to CPAs, attorneys, and CFP certificates. Despite the many credentials he's earned, Alan claims he can still keep investing simple and dares us to be dull and think like second graders in our investing. His professional goal is to never be confused with Jim Cramer. Alan Roth? Welcome to Catching Up to Fi. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. So let's start a little bit. Well, you're an accomplished guy in life. And take us back a little bit to your early money scripts, how you got so interested in finance and work through almost all aspects of finance in your career. Well, I probably first got interested uh, when I was a kid and my dad had my brother and I each buy a stock, which, by the way, the one I bought was a total dud, like the vast majority of individual stocks. So always kind of interested in money. Um, do you want a little bit of background? Absolutely. Yeah. The audience wants to know who you are. So, you know, I, I majored in accounting and I went to work for one of the big eight accounting firms. Now they're down to big four. Got my CPA. Uh, did that for two miserable years. It seemed like 20, but it was only two. So I went back to business school to get my MBA for very greedy reasons. I went to Northwestern Kellogg to learn how to beat the market. And along came Burton Malkiel's random walk down Wall Street book, which convinced me that's a really stupid goal. So I did corporate finance consulting at McKinsey and Company, uh, rose in corporate finance to become officers of two multi-billion dollar companies, but it was never my natural habitat. So when Kevin was born 25 years ago, I hit my midlife crisis and left the corporate world, started doing some consulting, and then eventually started my firm, WealthLogic, on an hourly basis. I looked at every profession on earth is fee-for-service. Even the oldest profession on earth is fee-for-service. So trying to capture money to go ahead and charge 1% for the rest of their lives or commissions didn't seem like the right model. And before I knew it, I found myself writing for Money Magazine back when it was then. That was the most fun I ever had. It was a column called The Mole. It was an undercover column, not under my name, on some of the hidden secrets of, of my industry. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was teaching and I 
was just kind of luck that teaching, writing, and advisory all fit in to, together. I would love to say it was a brilliant planning, but it had nothing to do with that. You say that you're happier than ever doing this and that you failed at retirement. Is that true? Yeah. I My whole life, I've been frugal, earned a fair bit of money. I couldn't wait till I was financially independent. And once I became financially independent, got off the corporate bandwagon, had wonderful experiences there, but it wasn't my natural habitat. I was like, what the heck do I do? I, I, I don't enjoy golf. And I just started doing these side gigs like a little bit of teaching, a little bit of writing. And then I thought I would just do some occasional financial planning. But before I knew it, I was working very long hours again, but loving it. Well, that's a great place to be in, to still have work to do that you love. Probably like Bill and I, you feel like you're helping folks meet their goals, helping them to walk a little bit better path than what they would have done on their own. Yeah, hopefully, my my clients tend to be pretty wealthy. Uh, but hopefully my writing and such gets to people of all different demographics. We want to talk for just a minute about the retirement crisis. And I know for a lot of folks in our audience, they feel like they're having their own personal retirement crisis when they wake up late and then go, oh my gosh, what do I do now? So can you talk to us for a few minutes about the retirement crisis and how bad is it? Well, I'm I'm no expert on it. But yeah, when we switched from defined benefit to defined contribution 401k, 403 type B type of plan, it shifted the responsibility for retirement from the corporation to the individual. And the the data is, is pretty ugly about people who aren't prepared for retirement. In fact, early on in my practice, one of my big ahas were when people would come to me, often physicians, very optimistic about their retirement, they hardly saved a penny. People who were pessimistic, I'll never be able to retire, had more than enough uh, to retire. So I think there are going to be a lot of people that are going to either work the rest of their lives or learn to live on social security and maybe just a little extra. Uh, People aren't going to die. It's not as serious as the pandemic, but it's, uh, it's a very serious problem. Dan Ariely, behavioral economist, shows that people get used to things pretty quickly. So people may have to get used to living the life of luxury. You know, the book, The Millionaire Next Door, shows that the people who have the nicest cars, biggest houses, belong to the best country clubs, aren't millionaires necessarily. The millionaire next door is somebody who was frugal, lived below their means, and saved money. So I think people will get used to it, but it is a problem, the retirement crisis. And you guys are doing the right thing by helping people wake up. It's never too late to start living below your means, but doing it earlier is better. Now, they say that you've got to save like a pessimist and invest like an optimist, and that gets you where you want to go. Do you think that this problem of the retirement crisis is generational? I'm a Gen Xer. I fell into that hole, the lost generation of missing the boat on the transition from pensions to 401k. Nobody took me aside and said, max out your 401k. And I am the traditional physician that went along that path you talk about. And I woke up at 50 and have made great headway since then, much like our audience is doing so. Do you think this retirement crisis is predominantly Gen X and our generations after Gen X doing better with their money? You know, I'm really not sure. I'm just going to punt on that question. I really... You know, I see, first of all, the people that I see, even younger people, older, middle age, it's a very biased sample. Those are the people that have saved. So, uh, you know, I don't necessarily, I can tell you that when I teach undergrad, I'm really impressed by the students and they're, you know, wanting to learn more about finance. But then again, I'm teaching finance. It's an elective class. You know, it's a very biased sample size, even for the younger people, to tell you the truth. Some people are savers and some people are spenders. And we we touched on this in an earlier conversation. But the two factors are, number one, our insula, a, a piece of our brain that's associated with bitterness, unpleasantness and such. And some people have an active insula, which means that they get feedback when they spend money and it teaches them to be frugal. 
Some people have an inactive insula and keep spending. And then there's also, for those of us that are savers, there's a joy of saving. There's a joy of reaching a milestone, knowing that you're getting closer to that financial independence, having choices in life, being able to do what you want with your life. Money doesn't buy happiness, but lack of money will buy misery. Yeah, it seems like spending gives you the dopamine hits that everybody wants, and it's a short-term gratification type thing. And I've gamified my savings, and it is fun. Once you do it, it's amazing how your lifestyle doesn't have to change when you move to a 40 or 50% savings rate, which we recommend for our late starters in order to get where they want to go. Uh, Money has a lot of emotional impact, and you're one of the experts on behavioral finance. Let, Let me talk briefly about the three purposes of money by Jonathan Clements. Do you remember what those are, or do you need me to reiterate those? Well, let's see. I'm going off of memory, but I believe it has, uh, you don't have to think about money. You've got, you can do what you want with your life. Why don't you read the three? Yeah, Jonathan Clements says, having it makes you worry less about it. Money can give you freedom to pursue your passions. And most importantly, money can buy you time with your friends and family. Uh, And that's where happiness comes from. And we forget about that. You know, we think the purposes of money are to become rich and wealthy. And we get lost in the balance of happiness along the way in the journey. Yet no one has taught me more about money and happiness than Jonathan Clements, who I also blame for getting me into writing and such as well. Yeah, you know, money is the ability to do what you want with your life. And one of the many things that I've got wrong is I remember as a kid, if I went with my friends to a movie, it'd be over in two hours. But if I bought something with my allowance, bought stuff, I would have it forever and ever. And boy, did I have that completely wrong. I mean, happiness comes from experiences and being with friends, being with others and and using that money for time is is, is very valuable. Mm-hmm. That's that's something that I had to learn, and and I think a lot of people do. An an accumulation of stuff is not what's going to make us happy. That that it's it's, and I've totally have changed over to the experiences and family and friends. Let's circle back around to some of the the emotional parts of money. You know, money itself is amoral. It doesn't have any morals. It has no good or bad intentions of its own. Yet, you put it in the hands of well-meaning, mostly clear-thinking, somewhat intelligent adults, and we attach all kinds of emotions to it and don't always make good choices with it. In fact, you share a comment from Dr. Daniel Kahneman that we're not even very good at learning from our mistakes with money. So how do our emotions and biases send us in the ditch with money? How is it that adults behave badly? We're not efficient learners. (laughs) And and by the way, I'm guilty as well. (laughs) You know, I'll say something to my wife that doesn't go well. Three days later, what do I do? It still doesn't go well. That's the (laughs) definition of insanity. I'm there. That's right. We try again and it still doesn't work. So, I I mean, we'll we'll probably talk a little bit about about my book, but when you're eight years old, money doesn't mean anything to you, mainly a candy bar or, or something like that. And while I can't predict markets, people are pretty predictably irrational. So we behave badly. So stocks go way up and we think, oh, I can take a lot of risk. I'm very risk tolerant. Then suddenly stocks plunge. Well, this has never happened before. We've never had a pandemic in our lifetime. I'm going to get out of the market until things settle down. And we are programmed to buy high and sell low. Morningstar does a lot of research on this. We know that the average active mutual fund underperforms the index that it's meant to beat. But the average investor underperforms those individual funds. And an example would be Kathy Wood's ARK Innovation Fund. It was really, really hot. Money poured into it. And then suddenly it started way underperforming. And recently money is pouring out of it. Magellan was another example, the Fidelity Magellan Fund, Peter Lynch. It was so hot for so long, money pours into it. 
And it's still something like $28 billion, even though it's had underperformance for at least two decades. Okay. One of the other things you talk about in your chapter on biases and the poor behavior of adults is loss aversion or prospect theory. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah. Daniel Kahneman actually won a Nobel Prize. He was the first psychologist to win a Nobel Prize in economics. And what it essentially says is, yes, we get pleasure out of making money, but we get roughly twice as much misery out of losing money. So a dollar loss hurts twice as much as a dollar gained. And I use that in many ways. Um, Probably 70, 80% of my clients, I'm getting less aggressive. So in other words, as, as Bill Bernstein would put it, William Bernstein, when you've won the game, stop playing. doesn't mean you get out of stocks, but you take risk off the table. And I explained to them that losing this money is going to have consequences. You can no longer send the grandkids to college. You can no longer buy that lake house you've always wanted because those consequences hurt a lot more than making additional money. Jonathan Clements has a great curve, you know, showing the relationship between money and happiness. If I win the Powerball, yes, I bought one Powerball ticket. I buy one a year. It's great entertainment for two hours. (laughs) <laughs> you do that. That is, that is that is one of those poor decisions in life, thinking that you know, the odds are so against you. But to hear that Alan Roth buys a lottery ticket, that is almost dumbfounding to me. When I was writing for Money Watch, I was asked to write a column about advising people not to buy a lottery ticket. I said, I'll write about it, but I'm going to advise people to buy one lottery ticket. It's great <laughs> entertainment. For for a, a, a few hours, you know, uh, thinking about what it would be like to to win that. Well, the billion dollars is only six hundred and twenty four million uh, if you take it up up front. But it's good entertainment, and you know, is it a tax on the poor for people that buy the lottery tickets uh, every week? Absolutely, and you you got to avoid that. Well, one thing we've learned from that, too, is a lot of those lottery winners end up bankrupt because their habits prior to this windfall don't change and they spend it all. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've, I've heard that a million times and I suspect it's directionally true. Something like 95% of those that win the jackpot lose it all in five years. So I've never seen any data to support that. But it's probably true. It's probably true that you, you win this money and then, you know, lo and behold, you get a lot of helpers wanting to come in and long lost relatives and friends. Mm. Can you invest in this? Can you, can I borrow that? Uh, I I suspect it's directionally true. Mm -hmm. Other things you talk about in your chapter are human optimism and overconfidence. And how does that affect our investing? Yeah, well, you know, optimism is we think we can do really well. And probably physicians overall probably have the most uh, (laughs) overconfidence. And when you think about it, Bill, you 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 beat the odds, you got into medical school, you went through medical school, you did the slave labor residency, you beat the odds. And and what works, by the way, in in, in something like that doesn't work uh, when it comes to investing. So we tend to have a lot of overconfidence that we think we can, you know, easily pick those winning funds. And optimism, you know, I ask people in college basketball. What percent of the time do you think the team that is behind at halftime comes back and wins? You, you, you get, you've read the book, right, Bill? So you can't Absolutely. I love this analogy. Please, please continue. <laughs> okay. And, and people typically guess 30%, 40%, 50%, 55%, even 90% I've had. The answer is a little over 20%. Just updated it. And the reason why we think it's much higher is from optimism, what makes the news? The team that is behind by 10 points at halftime and loses by 25, or the team that's behind at 20 at halftime and comes back and wins in triple overtime? How many movies have you seen where the horrible sports team in the beginning of the movie uh, ends up the horrible sports team? So we think that it's very easy. And, And how many ads for funds in the Wall Street Journal, do you think we'll be advertising, we have a one star underperformance. <laughs> Our time is coming. So those are sorts of things that, that 
biases that we learn that leads us to some very destructive behavior Mm -hmm. when it comes to investing. Well, we think that we can pick better. And if we feel like we can't, we think we can pick the person who can pick better. Absolutely. <laughs> and and that doesn't always work either. Uh, that very, very rarely works. The more you add in fees, the lower your return is going to be. Whatever the market earns, mm-hmm. the market earns 10%. And the average person is paying their helpers and their helpers' helpers 2%, then they're going to get 8%. It's just simple mathematics. Well, you refer to that in your book as the claw, and you describe that to your son. Can you tell us what the claw is and how that is an example of the 10 minus 2 equals 8? Well, the claw is an arcade game. So you walk into it and you see all these wonderful prizes, the watch, the stuffed animal, and it looks so easy. You put in a quarter. Now it's probably a dollar. Uh, You put in a quarter and you can control the claw, let it come down, pick up that tool. And for 25 cents, you're going to win this amazing stuff. But of course, they don't make the claw to give out (laughs) more prizes than than they earn. So Kevin quickly learned that it's a waste of money or maybe one or two quarters when we're at the arcade, but not to keep pouring money into it. And that's kind of like like active investing, the the funds, the managers that are celebrated for doing so incredibly well that we want to put money in there. And the more money we put in for that shiny prize, the more money we lose. Alan, before we get too far into this, let's circle back just a second. And we're talking about the book that you wrote, How a Second Grader Beats Wall Street. So, and you're talking literally about your son, Kevin, who at the time was a second grader. That's correct, right? Yeah, he was eight years old in second grade. All right. So, so give us a little background on why you decided to start teaching your second grader about investing. And then how did that turn into a book for adults? Well, he was given some money from his, from my mother, his grandmother. And we're going to invest it. And I learned as I was doing my financial planning practice, the things that I was teaching my son were just the opposite of what many investors were doing. You know, Kevin, it's better to buy things here because it's a lower price than buying it over there. Better to buy when it's low. And what were people doing? Buying after the market hits an all-time high, selling when it plunges. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't lend money to someone that's not going to pay you back, a.k.a. high-yield junk bonds. So it was those sorts of lessons. And investing was so simple that with a couple of funds, he can own the world. Actually, with one fund, he could own the world. But for, for reasons we want to overweight the U.S., we do it in two funds. So it was just simple lessons that I could see so many adults were violating. I I mean, you try to explain to any eight-year-old why stocks went way up and you bought, then stocks plunged and you sold, and they're not going to understand it. They're going to think you're kidding. But that's exactly what investors do. Like I said, I can't predict markets. I know I don't know, but I can predict human behavior, Dan Ariely's book, Predictably Irrational, it wasn't necessarily about investing, but it describes you know, how we are as, as humans. We're not only irrational, but we can predict that be irrational behavior. Yeah. And one of the things you emphasize in your book is all I learned about investing came from when I was in second grade. I didn't need to evolve into a complex adult and overcomplicate investing. Uh, your second grader in his portfolio was one of the lazy portfolios that was in the top of the market watch. Uh, can you tell us real briefly what exactly the portfolio was? It's three funds, the basic second grader portfolio. It's a total U.S., the VTSAX that J.L. Collins talks about, or the ETF version of it, VTI, which has an even lower expense ratio, which owns as close as possible to every publicly held company in the United States. 
And I do believe, just like Becky, Becky and I live in Colorado, we wouldn't only buy Colorado stocks. Bill, you live in Illinois. You shouldn't only buy Illinois stocks. So I'm a believer in owning international stocks as well, which has not been an easy thing. So with a total international stock index fund, VTIAX, that's the Vanguard Total International Mutual Fund, or the much lower expense share class, VXUS, is the ETF version that owns as close as possible to every company, publicly held company based outside the United States. Doesn't own Russia anymore, and I'm okay with that. Um, and then the total bond owns as close as possible to every investment grade U.S. fixed rate taxable bond. So it's a diversified, high credit quality, roughly 68% backed by the U.S. government or a U.S. government agency. Those were the three second grader core funds. And then when my son was eight, he could take a lot of risks. So 90% stocks. But you can have that same three fund portfolio for any level of risk. Taylor Larimore wrote another great book about the three fund portfolio. Taylor Larimore is one of the two founders of the Bogleheads movement. Alan, just out of curiosity, is the total bond fund the same one that JL talks about, the VBTLX? Yeah. VBTLX okay. is the mutual fund and BND is the lower cost ETF. ETF. Class. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That has corporate bonds, mortgage-backed securities, a great smattering across the U.S. William Bernstein talks about an intermediate treasury fund as in not taking the corporate bond risk, where you see a bigger dip in down markets with the total bond market fund and maybe a less of a dip uh, and maybe quicker recovery with a treasury bond fund. Why do you recommend the total bond market fund as, as opposed to a safer intermediate treasury fund? Well, the total bond is, is pretty darn safe. It, in terms of de, in terms of default risk, interest rate risk comes from the duration, the length of the bond I I itself. But uh, I think Bill agrees with total bond uh, index fund. But and Jack Bogle, by the way, who I think the absolute world of and and was just an incredible inspiration to me as I started my practice, he believed in half corporate and half total bond, so overweight in corporate. So it's for the same sort of reason that we want to own as close as possible to all the highest credit quality bonds. And, you know, companies, for, first of all, the total bond index fund uh, follows what's now called the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index, but it used to be called the Lehman Brothers Aggregate Bond Index. So, you know, that's why we diversify after 150 years on Wall Street, Lehman Brothers became extinct. So I don't think it's going to matter a whole heck of a lot. And, you know, one of the alternatives to the total bond fund, well, there were two alternatives mentioned, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, TIPS, and then CDs, which I still think have a great place in one's portfolio and is the one advantage that small investors have since, you know, the FDIC insurance is or NCUA if it's a credit union is typically two hundred and fifty thousand um, per depositor. So those those were ways of investing safely and earning more than the the treasury or or the total bond. I just happened to look a, a four year CD is paying roughly sixty bips, uh, 06 percent more than that four year treasury. And it's a little complex to explain, but it has a fairly easy early withdrawal penalty so that if rates go up, rather than suffer the loss of a bond fund, you pay that small penalty and get out and don't suffer the loss of total bond fund and treasuries loss of the similar duration, uh, both in the neighborhood of 12, 13% last year, which was the worst year ever in the history of the bond market. So where do you put the CDs and the say the CD ladder that you recommend or the rolling CD plan? Do you put them in your pre-tax portfolio? Do you put them in the after-tax portfolio? And does it substitute for part of the fixed income part of your plan with the total bond market fund? Yeah, it, it is part of the total 
it is part of the fixed income. I, I have that in the bond category. So where do you put it? All things being equal, fixed income is more tax efficient in the tax deferred accounts, the traditional IRAs and 401ks, not the Roths, but the traditional. But it depends on lots of different factors when you need the money, how you want to pick an overall asset allocation. That takes that's the primary goal. But then the secondary goal is locating the assets where they're most tax efficient. And stock index funds are very, very tax efficient. And all things being equal, they belong in your taxable account. Bonds or CDs are very tax inefficient, taxed at the higher rate. They belong in the tax deferred. And then if you think about it, if you own stocks in your traditional IRAs or 401ks, then you're converting what would have been a long-term capital gain into ordinary income when you pull it out to live on or have to pull it out because of the required minimum distributions. So I've always said investing is simple. I never said taxes were. Probably the vast majority of what I do with clients is, is tax related. Alan, in your book, you talk about that 10 minus for a second grader, 10 minus two is eight. But all of us want to say that 10 minus two is 12. Mm-hmm. And so talk a little bit about fees. I mean, we've talked uh, fees with other guests also, but give us your take on fees. And then you actually help folks manage their portfolios. And so what's different about what you do? Yeah, I don't manage portfolios. I advise on billions. I have zero assets under management. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the analogy that I like to make, when you say 10 minus two equals 12, mm-hmm. when people come back from Las Vegas, I was just there speaking a few weeks ago at a conference. I asked them if they won money. And roughly two out of three say, yes, we won money in Las Vegas. And of course, common sense says they don't build those multi-billion dollar casinos to give money away. So it's kind of like I'm an above average driver. Me and 95% of the rest of us are above average drivers. But of course, mathematically, only 50% can be above average. So it's easy to have the illusion that we're beating the market. And I see so much crooked benchmarking, you know, comparing here's your total return to the return of the S&P 500 index, which is stripped of dividends. Here's how you beat the market. Uh, I see less and less of that as the S&C is, SEC is starting to crack down on this. And my friend, Jim Cramer, uh, is even... Uh, has been cracked down on uh, quoting returns of the raw S&P 500 index. It's like comparing the total return of the total market to part of the return of part of the market. Well, how has uh, Kevin's second grader portfolio performed against Jim Cramer's approach? Um, <laughs> I've been chewed out twice by Jim Cramer's uh, senior vice president of media relations. who's told me that Jim Cramer reads everything I write about him. I'm like, wow, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a ton of data out there uh, showing how Jim Cramer's performance has way, way underperformed the market. He's a great entertainer and he's brilliant, but neither of those translate into beating the market. Well, apparently Kevin watched Jim Cramer and he preferred to watch SpongeBob. Yeah, you know, this is this is bordering on child abuse. Uh, <laughs> please don't turn me in. But as I was writing the book, uh, or, or before then, actually, I had Kevin watch about 10 minutes of Mad Money. And Jim Cramer, especially then, was, you know, he was blowing horns and booyah, yelling and screaming and uh, whistles and all all that. And and Kevin thought it was some sort of adult behavior that he didn't understand, a funny sort of thing. So he didn't want to watch it anymore. Uh, He he, he didn't want to watch uh, news shows or CNBC, uh, et cetera, uh, on, on market investing. He preferred SpongeBob, which was a whole lot better than trying to listen to foolish advice from financial media. Well, he also refers to the fact that 
you would watch the markets on a daily or weekly basis. And he preferred to watch SpongeBob. And he he realized that when you watch the markets, you went from being grumpy to looking like you had a bad headache or something like that. Why would you do that? That's adult bad behavior. Absolutely. And I'm still absolutely guilty. Let me see what the market's doing right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and when you think about it, let's get back to prospect theory, that we get twice as much pain from losing a dollar is making a dollar. So if you look at the market 10 times a day, on average, you're going to have, you know, in, in the long run, five ups, five downs. And that's going to cause me twice as much pain. So why do I do it? People make excuses for me. Well, you're an investment advisor. You have to do it. And I don't have to do it. I'd be thrilled if you asked me what the market was doing before we started this video. And I could honestly say I didn't know. But I did look. I do know. So, <laughs> you know, understanding bad behavior is one thing. Correcting it is another thing. I'm a flawed human being. I try very hard not to react to it. And, and let me tell you, you know, buying stocks during the pandemic when stocks fell 35% in 33 days in, in 2020 between February 19th and March 23rd was an incredibly difficult thing to do. But I did it. And it worked. So did I, and it does work. <laughs> I need to know, or we need to know, and the audience needs to know, do you follow your own advice to your son? What does your own portfolio look like? Oh, my portfolio is much more complex because there weren't these total stock index funds out there when I started investing. And my first index fund, by the way, I, I was sleeping under a bridge. I hadn't heard of Jack Bogle in, um, in Vanguard. This was in the late 1980s, 1889, I believe. Um, I started with the Dreyfus S&P 500 index fund, which by the way, had a zero expense ratio, which of course they later jacked up to 0.5% trapping money in between paying capital gains or continuing the higher fees. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I've made lots of mistakes. At least with an S&P 500 fund, you can buy something called an extended market index fund, which is the other 20% of the market. And those are the, you know, every stock based in the United States, that's not in the S&P 500. So I can complete that and get a total stock index fund without paying these huge amounts of taxes. But my portfolio, it's roughly 45% in stocks. I've won the game. The, the, the need to uh, keep playing you know, isn't there. It's two thirds US, one third international, the vast majority or total stock index funds. On the fixed income, it's total bond, it's CDs, it's treasuries, and fairly new is a, a million dollar tips ladder, treasury inflation protected securities, which by the way, is the first thing that I found in investing that both feels good and makes economic sense. Because when you think about it, during the pandemic, what would have felt good would have been to get out of stocks, and that would have been the, the wrong thing to do. Well, you actually wrote a recent article on tips, and I, for our audience, it might be worth explaining what they are, and then take us through the process of why you find that your safe withdrawal rate with a tips ladder is incredibly higher than what you recommend based on a traditional portfolio. Yeah, I certainly don't recommend putting all your eggs in this basket, but TIPS are treasury inflation protected securities. So they're treasury instruments, just like a regular old treasury bill that might pay 4.5% interest. But a TIP pays a certain interest rate plus whatever the consumer price index is, the CPIU, Consumer Price Index Urban. So it gives you some protection against inflation. And a TIPS bond fund doesn't give you that protection, but buying individual tips does. So roughly a year and a half ago, tips were yielding inflation minus 1.6%. But just like what happened to nominal bonds last year, real interest rates on tips went way up. So tips did just about as poorly as the total bond fund last year. Not quite, but but within a fraction of 1%. Uh, 
So now suddenly tips are yielding about inflation plus 1.8%. So what I was able to do was to build a 30-year tips ladder with some imperfections that essentially gives me a certain amount every year. And it worked out to be about a 4.38% payout plus whatever inflation is. And the real yield happened to be about 1.8%. So, you know, part of what Jonathan Clements writes about is, is, is that money is security. So with that tips ladder, and, and I'm doing this with clients as well, we're able to build a floor that no matter what happens, and yes, I realize there's some risk here, that Social Security plus the tips ladder provides a 30-year cash flow that I know as a minimum I could live on and my clients can live on. It's the security. It's that floor. As long as the U.S. government survives and a big if, if the government doesn't cut Social Security, that that's a floor. And the reason to do it was both psychological, but it also made economic sense. So this is where things get a little more complicated from your three fund portfolio, but you do this with your high net worth clients. And I think I remember you saying that uh, about 20% of your fixed income portfolio ends up being tips for optimal uh, management. Yeah, I I generally like having no more than 20% of the fixed income. And that's because Tips are a newer instrument, and it's a really good basket, but getting back to one of the second grader rules, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Tax laws could change, and there are some downsides of the tips. It violates that simplicity, certainly. Building it takes a little bit of time, and and tipsladder.com, by the way, written by a Boglehead, uh, is just a good way of, it shows you how to build that tips ladder based on your your goals. So it does violate that. Uh, but once it's built, it's fairly simple. And, and a tips fund uh, doesn't do that. Uh, I, I wrote another piece and um, John Reckenthaler at Morningstar piggybacked on that piece saying we need a new fund like a hole in the head. But a self-liquidating tips fund to provide that guaranteed cash flow is something I've kind of challenged the financial industry to uh, uh, to, to look at. Very different than, let's say, um, the iShares TIP or the Vanguard, uh, I think it's VAIPX tips uh, funds, which which is not a self-liquidating uh, sort of thing and doesn't give you the protection of owning the tips themselves. And the one bond, by the way, that I'm comfortable in telling people it's okay to buy is a bond that's backed by the U.S. government, the only entity licensed to print U.S. dollars. I remember as a kid hearing, so goes General Motors, goes America, and bondholders there got back five cents on the dollar. Common shareholders got back nothing. I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. So you're recommending tips in addition to Social Security at that point in our, at that stage in our life of being our income source. Correct. Cash flow source, because it's not, you know, people love to say, if I sell you this annuity, you're going to get a you know seven and a half percent income, but in reality, it's return of your own principal and some income. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you recommend annuities as, at all as a income floor? Annuities, the best annuity on the planet, is delaying Social Security. Mike Piper's OpenSocialSecurity.com, by the way, is mm-hmm. the single best free calculator out there. But when you buy an annuity, For the most part, what you're doing is buying an indirect investment. So if you look at what the insurance company is invested in, you're going to see it's roughly 85 to 90 percent in bonds, investment grade bonds and some stocks and alternative investments. And you're going to get their return minus their costs, minus their profits, minus the commission that they pay to the agent uh, who sold it. So generally speaking, I'm you know, pretty much against annuities. There are some simple annuities like multi-year guaranteed annuities, which are kind of like CDs that are backed by the insurance company rather than uh, the FDIC. In some cases, they can make sense, but generally not. Things like 
uh, fixed indexed annuities, you know, where you get some of the upside of the market without any downside risk. You know, those used to be called equity indexed annuities, and they got such horrible press that they were very well deserved. And the insurance industry, let's change the name to fixed indexed annuities. Okay, there's other aspects of sort of factor-based investing or specific, more complicated investing that you might have thoughts on as well. We talked to Paul Merriman, uh, and uh, I'm aware of Rick Ferry's total economy portfolio and his core four strategy. And both of them there talk about small cap value and its benefits with higher risk. Can you give us your take on adding small cap value to a, quote, simple portfolio? Well, remember, a total stock index fund owns small cap value, which is roughly 3% of the total stock market. And I love Paul Merriman. I agree with 99% of what he says. He blurbed my book. I think I blurbed one of his books. He, he's absolutely wonderful. But the, the, the data comes from, you know, since 1928, small cap value stocks have way outperformed the market. Well, in 1928, 1938, 1948, 1958, there were no small cap value funds. And the cost, the commissions, the bid ask spreads of buying these small cap value funds, you know, would have outweighed any gain one could get. So, you know, theoretically, did it perform well back when you couldn't invest in it? Yes. But even uh, Eugene Fama and Ken French, who came up with the, the three-factor model, small cap and value, um, never said it was a free lunch, said it was compensation for taking on more risk. It's less tax efficient. I thought it would outperform, but I didn't believe in it because it was uh, riskier. And it has just incredibly underperformed over the last 15 years or so. Can it continue to underperform? I keep saying no, but it seems to keep underperforming. By the way, almost all of the return of the market this year is coming from seven companies, all large cap tech, uh, large cap growth tech companies. So, you know, I do believe that overweighting small cap value is sophisticated performance chasing. Morningstar, Christine Benz and Jeff Patak, they, they did a podcast on me a few years ago, and they, I, I love the title that they picked, which was why I embrace dumb beta, because smart beta is picking up some of these so-called free lunches of, of smaller cap stocks, value stocks, and now there's like over 500 different factors out there that worked brilliantly in the past and unlikely to work going forward. Alan, can you uh, explain real quick what you mean by beta? Some of the folks in the audience may not have heard that term before. Beta is earning the return of the market. So smart beta is we're going to get the market return, but we're going to get more than the market because we're going to pick these factors, not just small cap and value, but it can be momentum and other factors as well. And that's sophisticated performance chasing, sophisticated active investing. And I'm thrilled, by the way, to have convinced Rick Ferry to go to the simple model rather than the small cap value tilted DFA type of models. And DFA is a very good firm, but I just don't believe. And, and you know, some people experimented with drugs when they were young. I experimented with DFA, dimensional fund advisors, and you know. It was, uh, you know, and bought some small cap value. And I was actually quite disappointed, uh, even when it was performing well, how tax inefficient it was. It was generating capital gains. And, you know, at one point I was probably 95% Vanguard and 5% DFA. Now I'm probably 99 and 1%. So I want the market return. Earning the market return means that I'm going to beat the vast majority of investors out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you also talk in your book about positive and negative correlation. So can you explain a little bit about what that is? And then if we are invested, this is my simple, you know, thought process question. If we're invested in the total U.S. stock market, do we need to worry about correlation? Um, 
Well, I mean, correlation, it would be absolutely wonderful if we could find two asset classes that both had really attractive returns and had a negative correlation, meaning that they typically moved in opposite direction, which is really wonderful in theory, but very, very hard to find in practice. I mean, we could have a S&P 500 index fund and an inverse S&P 500 index fund, and those are going to be negatively correlated, but you're also going to get a zero return or a negative return overall. So bonds, for instance, overall have about a zero correlation with stocks. And zero means half the time they're going to move in the same direction and half the time they're going to move in opposite directions. And last year, 2022, happened to be one of those years when they moved in the same direction. Not all that uncommon, but it was the magnitude of the loss of bonds last year that was so huge. Can I explain why bonds and interest rates move in opposite directions? Sure. Okay. A bond is a loan. So when you buy BBTLX or BND, Vanguard Total Bond, or iShares AGG, you're lending money to the government and the corporations, and they're going to pay you principal and interest. So Becky, let's say you lend me $100 at 10%. I'm sorry, at 5%. Then I'm going to pay you for 10 years, $5 a year, and the 10th year, I'll pay you $5 interest plus your $100 principal back. That's a bond. Now, let's say right after you lent it to me, rates went up to 7%. So that means you're going to collect $50 interest over the next 10 years, but the market says 70 is now the going rate. So the value of that loan of that bond has gone down, and that's what happened last year. Interest rates shot way up. The other way bonds can fall is Alan Roth files for bankruptcy, you likely get nothing back. And what happened last year wasn't so much the bankruptcy, it was all the surging rates that caused the bonds to be worth less money. And it was the worst year in the history of the bond market. If we, if the world is not a, a bell shaped curve. You know, if we look at it statistically what happened to the bond market last year, it should have happened once out of every 50 million years. It was the equivalent of what happened to the uh, stock market during the Great Depression, the stock market plunge. But we live in a world with fat tails. But bonds overall are, are safer than stocks because, like I said, in a bankruptcy, the common shareholder is the lowest in the pecking order. They typically lose everything. E even with General Motors, bondholders got back something, even, even though it was five cents on the dollar. So bonds overall are less risky than stocks, but their returns are going to be lower in the long run. And is that why you say bonds are, are shock absorber? Yeah, okay. high quality bonds. Now, usually I'm getting the other way around. You know, why wouldn't you want to own more investment grade and less corporate rather than, you know, all or less government rather? Uh, and, and the the answer is the government can print money. And boy, are we. Yes, I realize we almost defaulted on our debt earlier this year, but hopefully that would have, if, if we default on our debt for a long term, the entire portfolio is going to be worthless and survival might be what we're going for. One of the things you do with your more complicated second grader portfolio is add REITs. Can you tell us what REITs are and do they have a role in the portfolio today, given especially their correlation with the stock market? Yeah, well, you know, some the correlation is lower, but it's positive. And, and don't forget, U.S. stocks and international stocks have an incredibly high correlation, but very, very different performance. But a REIT is a real estate investment trust, not not the kind that the person is trying to sell to you a private REIT to make a 10% commission. But they're essentially publicly held stocks that are in the real estate business, and there's some different tax aspects of it as well. And in the, during the dot-com bubble, REITs did quite well as stocks plunged. During the last two bubbles, uh, not so much. But you already own REITs if you own a total stock index fund. But if you look at national wealth, most real estate is not in public markets. So there is an argument for some to own a little bit of this REIT index fund. And examples could be the, the Vanguard uh, REIT uh, in, index fund. The mutual fund is um, 
God, v VG, I'm blanking out the symbol. VNQ is the ETF version. They both have the same expense uh, ratio. But I think there's an argument to go into some REITs that you're more mimicking national wealth. But it also depends on, you know, how much of your net worth do you have in your house? Do you have a vacation house? Uh, you know, other factors as well. And, you know, we're heading into what many believe is going to be the debt bomb. There, there's so much vacancy in office space since the pandemic and people not wanting to return to work. And a huge portion of this has to be refinanced by 2025. You know, at, at the time when the the revenue stream is down, the, the value of the buildings are down, that this could cause, um, this could spread not only from the real estate industry, but to the entire economy. But I, at least it's a known entity. And usually what causes a stock market plunge is something we didn't see coming. A couple more things before we move to the conclusion of our podcast. You, one thing that I found interesting is you're interested in the total stock market fund for the U.S., but and not so much the S&P 500. And you talk about the Google effect. Can you tell us what the Google effect is and how it influences your choice of index fund? Sure. Um, the S&P 500 is good. The total stock is better, in my opinion. I once wrote a piece called The Case Against the S&P 500 Index Fund. And the day, day it published, I got a call from Jack Bogle's assistant, really chief operating officer, that you're going to get a letter from Jack on this. And of course, the letter came and he said, of course, you're right, but you know the, the, the two perform virtually the same. And he's, he's right on that too. So when a company, the S&P 500 stocks are picked by a committee by Standard & Poor's, and they announce when a company is being kicked out, and when a company is being admitted, like I think it was 2021, Tesla was admitted to the S&P 500 index fund. So when that happens, people know that all these S&P 500 funds out there have to go out and buy Tesla or Google back when it was called Google. Now it's Alphabet. So, you know, they're buying it at kind of a little bit of a higher price. So, you know, that is one reason why, am I, in my opinion, owning the total stock index fund is, is the superior choice. And by the way, I looked at, I think it was 2021. Which do you think performed better? An S&P 500 large cap index fund, a Vanguard mid cap index fund, a Vanguard small cap index fund, or a total stock index fund? Most people think it couldn't be the total, right? Because either large, mid, or small had to do better. Doesn't that make logical sense? Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The total stock market index fund trounced all three of those. And the biggest reason was Tesla wasn't in any of the three. And Tesla went up 700 and some odd percent that year. It wasn't until uh, late December that Tesla was added to that S&P 500 index fund. So owning everything is better than owning you know, the S&P 500 is roughly 80% of the total stock index fund, but it's missing that 20%. Just like I don't believe in overweighting small cap value, I don't believe in ignoring it either. Interesting. I'd never heard it put that way, and it really makes a good case for the total stock market index fund. Mm -hmm. yep. Right, right. Keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, well, one, one, of the things, one of the things that isn't so simple that I think we need to emphasize here is you talk about daring to rebalance and how hard it really is. We we know it theoretically, but in reality, it's almost like selling at the bottom and buying at the top. Tell us what rebalancing is and why it's so hard to do. Yeah, re rebalancing is picking an overall asset allocation and sticking to it. So I think I told you I'm 45% stocks. Again, because you know, our need to take risk is low. Dying the richest couple in the graveyard is not my goal. So when stocks plunge, you're going to have a much smaller proportion, which means that you have to buy to get back to that 45% asset allocation. And by the way, you know, I take risk profile questionnaires regularly, and, and I get I should be between 70% and 140%. I should have a margin account. <laughs> in in stocks. 
And, you know, had I been 70% in stocks, I never would have had the cash and the courage to rebalance, you know, back during the, um, when COVID hit or during the financial crisis or during the dot-com bubble. But it is one way of systematically buying low and selling high because then stocks recovered and guess what? I had to sell even if I had to pay taxes on it. So be it. But that rebalancing goes against everything that led us to survive as a species, you know, fear and greed. All right. So there is a a quote in your book. You say, if we pick the low hanging fruit, we don't have to climb the tree. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I see so much low hanging fruit out there. I mean, I can't tell you people that come to me. I've had two people in the last two months come to me with millions of dollars in a money center New York bank earning 0.02%. Wow. Just putting it into something like a Vanguard Treasury money market account yielding, I think, 5.06% is hundreds of thousands of dollars and happens to be backed by the U.S. government and state tax exempt. So there are these low hanging fruit things out there. You know, earning, the things have changed now with interest rates, but for so long, people would be earning, you know, 1.6% on their bonds and paying taxes on and having a mortgage. So they're lending money out at 1.6% and borrowing money at three and a half, four, five percent So it's, it's low hanging fruit paying it off. An expensive index fund has no chance of beating a lower cost index fund. So there are things that can, low hanging fruit is something that guarantees you a higher return without taking on more risk. One low hanging fruit that you talked about, I found fascinating and I'd never heard of anywhere before. You talk about a social security loophole. Can you tell us what you mean by that? And that is a, it's a fascinating way to look at social security. I can, but that rule went away since the book went out. Oh, okay. The rule was basically you could be taking Social Security for five years and then pay it back, have it reset, and getting it to the higher rate. But uh, the Social Security Administration closed that loophole as it should have been closed. Mm -hmm. So how is it that uh, Social Security is a great kind of one of the the best annuities that we can have. Explain your take on Social Security and some uh, strategies to take it. Well, it's an inflation-adjusted annuity for the rest of your life that's backed by the U.S. government. And several years ago, you could buy an annuity from an insurance company that was linked to the Consumer Price Index. And when you could do it, I did the calculations of how much delaying Social Security got versus buying the annuity on the open market. And it was like buying it at a 40 to 50 percent discount. Now, insurance companies won't even offer that because everyone's afraid of inflation and there's no way actuaries um, and insurance companies are very, very smart and they don't want to take that interest rate risk. So it's. It's an annuity that lasts the rest of your life that keeps up with inflation. Is there some risk in it? Yes, but there's also a lot of risk in buying annuities from insurance companies that the insurance company could go belly up. So as I mentioned, Mike Piper's OpenSocialSecurity.com is probably the best calculator out there. Someone you might want to have as a guest, by the way. Typically, what that shows is the person with the highest benefit, as long as both spouses are in good health, if both spouses are in bad health, you know, with short life expectancies, take it at 62, but hopefully that's pretty rare. But the person with the higher benefit should generally wait till age 70, and the person with the lower benefit of a couple, it's it's a much closer call and matters probably a whole lot less because that social security has a 100% survivor benefit. Mm -hmm. So my benefit is greater than my wife's, and we guys don't last as long as as you women. So she's likely to get my higher benefit Mm -hmm. when when I kick the bucket. 
we will do an episode on Social Security, and we will mm-hmm. uh, have Mike Piper on the show. Uh, that's absolutely important. Let's summarize what we've learned today. We've covered a lot of ground. You use at the end of your book the second acronym. So for people to remember the the simple second grader approach to investing, you talk about the S being simple, the E being emotionless, the C being cost matter, the O being obvious, you know, common sense, the N being nasty stuff, avoid complicated investments. If you can't understand what they wrote, then you shouldn't invest in it. And lastly, you talk about being diversified. That's a way for everybody to remember a summary of your book. Now, what grade is Kevin in now? And how is his portfolio doing? Kevin (laughs) is uh, three years post-college. He's 25 years old now. He's he's working for a really cool company. It's called Epic Systems. It's privately held, started by a woman, uh, over 10,000 employees, uh, no debt. And they have a 60% market share of electronic medical records, or as a lot of my physician clients say that uh, electronic medical records are the source key source of physician burnout. <laughs> so that's what he's doing. And he's working on his data mining. He, he, they, they, they've got over 100 million uh, HIPAA compliant medical records, and he's helping researchers try to find patterns and such between various disease states, drugs, uh, et cetera. His portfolio is doing quite well. It's still in the second grader portfolio. As you know, international has underperformed the US, but he's sticking to it. He's much better investor than me. He looks at the market maybe once a week uh, (laughs) rather than 10 times a day. Uh, But investing, if I could leave your listeners eight words on investing, any investment that you make or the portfolio as a whole must minimize expenses and emotions, maximize diversification and discipline. So you've got to own everything at the lowest cost. You've got to try to minimize those emotions and have the discipline to stick to something even when it's not working. Whether one should have a third or 40% or 0% in international, being consistent and having the discipline to stick to it and not performance chase is key. So minimize expenses, emotions, maximize diversification and discipline. Simple yes, easy no. So in your book, you have Kevin's fifth grade, a a postscript of Kevin's fifth grade lessons. Doing nothing is the key to investing. Let's all do nothing together. I love that. (laughs) Don't always look at what the market is doing. (laughs) We talked about that one, about your grumpy face. Um, If people tell you they know what the market is going to do, like tomorrow or the next day, don't listen to them. I love that. And remember, investing is simple. Don't overcomplicate things when you invest. So there's Kevin's advice to all of us. Kevin's a wise person, wiser <laughs> than us all adults. You know, <laughs> uh, we, we start out with innocence and curiosity and common sense. We grow mm-hmm. up and we become fearful, overconfident, uh, and complicated. We want to control everything. We got to right. focus on the simple things that we can control. Okay. We got to utilize Einstein's and Newton's advice. Can you tell us what their advice is to the simple investor? Well, it, it, it may be wrong in my book, but uh, very common saying is that Albert Einstein was once asked, "What's the most powerful force in the universe?" And he said, "The power of compounding." Jason Zweig at the Wall Street Journal says. That may not be true. It may just be a myth. You know, why would a physicist, mathematician think of anything, you know, other than a mathematical formula, an exponent uh, in an equation? But, you know, when one can save early and invest for the long run with those incredibly low costs and high diversification, you know, that compounding is going to work for you. Yeah, you can also have, as Jack Bogle would call it, the tyranny of compounding by paying helpers too much money and, uh, you know, having huge mistakes. Um, inertia, force and action tends to, an object in uh, action tends to stay in action unless something changes it. You know, we all say as humans, we love change, but the truth is we don't love change. So that inertia 
can either work for you or against you. If you're doing the right stuff, leaving it alone will work for you over time. Uh, doing the wrong stuff, it will work against you. Exactly. We we tend to panic when things aren't going the way we want them to. And any decision made in, in haste or in panic is usually not a good one. Yeah. Well, we don't think we're panicking. We come up with all logical reasons. We've never had a pandemic before. <laughs> uh, you know, this time it really is different. Right, right. It's different this time. I love that one. Yep. You know, that has to do with things like recency bias and confirmation bias. Uh, there are so many biases that work against us that kids don't have. Yeah. <laughs> they just don't have them. Absolutely. And, you know, Kevin's 25 now. Money's starting to mean more to him. He, he's losing some of his advantages, but luckily he doesn't care a whole lot about it and just keeps things going. Has Kevin come to you and say, but dad, I know better. <laughs> not yet not yet does he make fun of me for looking at the market and talking about the market and all that yeah do i deserve it absolutely <laughs> well it right. sounds like your conversations with a second grader have had a lasting impact one of the challenges we have is educating our kids on these lessons your book does an excellent job of doing this it predates the simple path to wealth it is very similar to the simple path to wealth you were on the money early and you tell us how to talk to our kids. And that's one of the generational things that we late starters who have made all the mistakes need to do because our kids have watched us make the mistakes and we've got to recover that. Your book is one of the ways we can help them recover. And I'm going to have my kids read it for sure. Let's wrap up here with a couple of things. Other than your work, your book, your writing, do you have any favorite resources that you would point in particular, late starters too, or investors in general? Uh, you know, number one, I would say go to the bogleheads.org, the Bogleheads forum. You've got thousands and thousands of people that post, you know, mostly without an agenda or profit motive. It's got a great search engine. You could look up exactly what you, you know, want to see. So that is probably the best resource. You've got a lot of very, very smart people who all, so don't all agree. It's not all just one simple thing. I've had lots of people make comments disagreeing with what I've written and such. So that's a great source. Um, I happen to think Morningstar is a wonderful source, both for data and people like Christine Benz and John Reckenthaler. He writes some incredibly good articles and such uh, about that. You know, Yahoo Finance is something I go to quite frequently to, to do some data analysis. I'm sure Google Finance is, is just as good. Inertia means I haven't spent as much time on Google Finance. But those are sources that I typically go to. There are lots of great books out there and terrible books out there. I think sometimes bad books have the best lessons. But you, a lot of Jack Bogle's writings are, are, are brilliant and, and timeless. Burton Malkiel's Random Walk Down Wall Street has been updated. So many times, Charlie Ellis winning the loser's game was just a brilliant book. And that was about avoiding mistakes. You know, tennis hackers like me, uh, we, we typically don't win a match by ha having dozens of winners. We typically win a match by making fewer mistakes. And, and that's kind of when it comes to investing. It's not the home run, it's the inertia of, of the long run returns of the compounded market that that tend to work over time. Very, very boring. I tell people if they're having exciting excitement in their investing, they're probably doing it wrong. Have an exciting life. Have a boring investment portfolio. That's very wise advice, I think. I love it. Do you have any specific tips that offer hope or actionable things for late starters to do? It's never too late to start. Uh, I think you guys are doing an incredible service for people that are waking up and realizing, holy crud, if I don't start doing something now, my life is going to be very different in retirement. So try to save as much as you can. One of the best ways of saving, in my opinion, is to automate it, to use that inertia, to have a certain amount taken out of your paycheck to go to your 401k, your Roth 401k in your taxable money to have Vanguard, Fidelity, whoever, 
automatically take a certain dollar amount every month and move it to your investment account. So setting things on an automated basis, then you get used to living on a lower amount. And the adjustment happens pretty quickly from what research shows. And then let compounding happen. And incredible, you know, the, the second best thing is to do nothing on the investment portfolio. The only thing better is to do that rebalancing occasionally. That's awesome. Well, this has been so wonderful to talk to you today, Alan. Lots and lots of nuggets for our audience. And uh, so my last question is, where can people reach you? The website is daretobedull.com. I love it. All right. We're incredibly grateful for you taking the time to support us a new endeavor. We're growing. And to have luminaries like you on the show, our audience is very excited about it. You've done a great service. You're incredibly generous. And I look forward to meeting you at the Bogleheads Conference in October. Me too. And by the way, you guys are doing incredibly good work to help people. And I'm thrilled to be a a small part of it. So thank you. Well, thank you, Alan. All right. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Okay. Take care now. See you in October. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Catching Up to Five. We would appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so that our message can reach others. We are not lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, or tax experts. Please consult your own professional advisors before making any important decisions. Our content is for entertainment and education purposes only. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five.